Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States. Good evening, and welcome back to the National Archives. <clears throat> This is our first big event since the pandemic started, and it's so great to have you back here in this building celebrating the, the National Archives and the American story. It's been a long 20 months. I want to start by thanking the National Archives and National Archives Foundation staff for their stamina, passion, and creativity pivoting to carry out our mission, getting us to this point, and I am so proud to be among them. Let me start with the, st with the sock reveal. For those of you new to the gala, I um, shamelessly plug a shop product by exposing my ankles. <laughs> and this year, with the image of the most important woman in the first 30 years of the Republic, in the words of our honoree. So someday we will see the, the James Madison book that's in, work, in the works, but the author seems to be fascinated with his wife and has spent a whole lot of time learning about her, I'm told. Tonight we're honoring Tennessee native John Meacham. He's a presidential historian, Pulitzer Prize winning author, professor at Vanderbilt, contributor to Time in the New York Times Book Review, podcaster and frequent commentator on television. To put it simply, he's everywhere. Through his in-depth research and unique voice, John Meacham has given us new insight into Andrew Jackson, Thomas Jefferson, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, George H.W. Bush, and John Lewis. His books have shined light on untold stories about these men and their moments in history. Here at the National Archives, we are pleased that he used records from the Franklin D. Roosevelt and then Baines Johnson, Gerald R. Ford, Ronald Reagan, and George H.W. Bush presidential libraries to tell these stories. John Meacham also writes about the responsibilities of citizenship, sometimes I feel something I feel strongly about. He encourages people to enter the arena, resist tribalism, respect facts, and deploy reason, find a critical balance, and most importantly, keep history in mind. In The Soul of America, John Meacham talks about an incident where President Harry S. Truman broke out a copy of the Bill of Rights and started reading it aloud to an angry woman. Truman later commented, it's not a bad idea to read those Ten Amendments every once in a while. Not enough people do, and that's one of the reasons we're in the trouble we're in. I couldn't agree more. I want everyone to visit the National Archives in person or online to see and learn from our founding documents. Because of this, we've made civics education a priority at the National Archives. We work to provide people with the tools they need to understand history and become active participants in our government. We recently launched We Rule Civics for All of Us. This program promotes civic literacy engagement through distance learning programs and draws upon the vast holdings of the National Archives to promote the knowledge and skills students need for civic engagement in the 21st century. I'd like to thank our partner, the National Archives Foundation, whose generous support helps the National Archives reach an ever larger and more diverse audience across the country. With the support of the National Archives Foundation and generous benefactors like you, we're able to make this shared vision of civic engagement a reality. And a very special thanks to Senator Durbin and Congressman Quigley for being here this evening and for their support of our major redesign of the public vaults exhibit area. Here at the National Archives, history comes alive through our records. John Meacham brings these American stories to the people. For this, we're forever thankful. And tonight, we'll honor his career and express our gratitude for encouraging citizenship and spreading history through his many books, podcasts, and lectures. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate our public-private partnership with the Foundation and pay tribute to John Meacham. 
Now it's my pleasure to introduce the Vice President of the National Archives Foundation Board of Directors, Lucinda Robb. Lucinda? Hello and welcome everyone to the 2021 Records of Achievement Awards and Gala. Now last year, we had a virtual event and it was great. We learned a lot, you can watch it online and it's got a lot for you. However, I have to say, it is a joy to be back in this building and to have real non-Zoom, three-dimensional people in the audience. So thank you for being here. This is also our opportunity to present our high, highest honor at the foundation, um, which we give to someone whose work brings American history to the national stage. Tonight, we celebrate John Meacham, whose research, writing, and storytelling embodies our mission. As the National Archives nonprofit partner, the foundation seeks to inspire a deeper appreciation of our history and hopefully help transform that into an active engagement with our country. Now, I'm not gonna go through a whole laundry list here. They only gave me two minutes to speak, but I do wanna mention a few of the important projects we've been involved with in the past couple of years. First, the archives has supported national civic programming, which David just told you about, to reach a younger generation eager to participate in our democracy. And if any of you have teenagers at home, you know they are gung-ho. Second, the foundation is funding the first ever Cokie Roberts Research Fellows. Their work will continue Cokie's legacy in shining a light on women who have so greatly contributed to our nation's history, but whose stories remain largely unknown. And last, but definitely not least, preparations are underway to celebrate the 250th anniversary of our nation right here at the home of the Declaration of Independence as the foundation takes on the critical role of preparing the museum and the public to celebrate this momentous occasion. Here at the foundation, we believe that history is so much more than just retelling the events of the past in some dry way. And through his wonderful writings, John Meacham fosters that same enthusiastic investment in our shared national story. We are grateful that you're joining us for this special evening. It is now my pleasure to introduce our host tonight and the chair of the National Archives Foundation Board of Directors, Governor Jim Blanchard. Thank you, Lucinda Robb. Thank you very much. As uh, our distinguished archivist, David Ferriero mentioned, uh, Lucinda is the vice president of our foundation and does a fabulous job. But it's more than that. You're actually an accomplished author in your own right. Along with Rebecca Roberts, you wrote the recent The Suffragist Playbook, your guide to the changing world, to changing the world, excuse me. Um, I think it's been a bestseller. You had a program here at the archives. Lucinda was also the founder of something called Kids Giving, which was an effort to encourage philanthropy in kids. I might also add that for many years, you actually worked in the legislative section of the archives. So we not only have a distinguished board, you're gonna meet all of them, I'm gonna have them stand up in a few minutes, but, but it's a working board and we, we appreciate all of them, all of you. We're glad all of you are here tonight. This is gonna be a great evening. Um, I might also want to, again, acknowledge our archivists because we have a partnership. We are the nonprofit partner of the National Archives, which is an independent federal agency. And we do everything we can to help support programming and resources and give advice when we can uh, so that the archives is protected uh, and uh, supported by the public and by our Congress as well. Also with John Meacham, I could talk a lot about John. I've read several of his books. Others are going to talk about John in great detail, and the person I'm going to introduce in a moment will introduce him, and then Michael Beschloss will be interviewing him. And Michael Beschloss is a special member of our board of directors. Michael, we really thank you. You know, we're, we're so thrilled to have John Meacham here, and he's brought to life so many of our nation's founders and leaders in ways that have enriched the American experience, but with Michael Beschloss, who, as I recall, has written about nine books on presidents. Is that right? Uh, it's a delight to have you. What? Yeah. 
Well, I've read most of them, and they're great. I recommend them. Uh, anyway, I love history. Most of our board members, by the way, are history lovers, as well as accomplished people in their various professions in their own right. But we look forward to your conversation with John Meacham. Uh, let me also say we have a lot of different VIPs here. It's always a risk to acknowledge them, but I need to do that. You saw earlier one of our great friends, Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She wasn't here by accident. She's always helped us, always supported us, attended so many of our functions. You couldn't stay the entire night, but I hope some of you at least saw her and heard her because she is not only one of the most powerful people in the world, but she's our friend here at the archives. And she cares about civic responsibility. She cares about civic learning. She cares about our history and is working on our future. Also, yes, you can. <laughs> we have several current members of Congress, though. I, I know he arrived moments ago, and I haven't had a chance to welcome, but Senator Dick Durbin is here somewhere. <laughs> Senator, where are you? And Congressman Mike Quigley. Bo both, both of these gentlemen are from Illinois. Mike Quigley, a, a great friend of the archives. <laughs> Congressman. We have uh, former senator and governor, Chuck Robb. Chuck. And I think he's joined by uh, Linda, Linda Robb, Linda Johnson Robb. You know, we all, you're always here, too. We, we appreciate it. One of my colleagues at our law firm is Congressman Charlie Dent. Charlie, thanks for being with us. Now, one of the most important cities in the universe, actually it's where the Kennedys spent a lot of time years ago, is the city of Bronxville, New York. The mayor is here, Mary Marvin, mayor of Bronxville, New York. Next to Ferndale, Michigan, you are the center of the universe. <laughs> anyway, um, we have a lot of, we, we have a number of former diplomats, um, and some of them are colleagues, but we do have the current, actually, former Colombian ambassador to the U.S., a superstar, now a current Colombia ambassador to Spain, Carolino Barco. Carolino, where are you? Ambassador, he's here. Um, but we do have former ambassadors, Faye Hartog-Levin, uh, David Jacobson, Lori Fulton, Glenn Davies. These are all people who serve the United States as ambassadors, and several of them are on our board. We also have the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, Daniel Deermeyer. <laughs> Chancellor, we're happy you're here. Thank you. Now, um, and our sponsors. Uh, we have a lot of sponsors. They're listed in your program book. Um, we have presenting sponsors who, are, uh, who played a major role, and that would include David Rubenstein, who you're going to meet in a moment. By the way, there's a gallery named after him here. Thank you very much. Uh, there's Jackie Mars. Again, Jackie, thank you. And John and Christy Johnson of Edgeworth Economics. You are presenting sponsors. We appreciate what you do. Now, we have a wonderful board. It's a working board. I'd like the members of our board of directors of the foundation to stand up, please. I'd also now like, we have an outstanding staff, and some of them are here, some are upstairs working right now, but I would like Patrick Madden and Jim Dumas and Laura Giroux and uh, Frank Cordes and others to stand up, our staff here at the archives. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> now I said we have a working board. Lucinda Robb is one example, of course. But so are the others. We love history. We love the American experience. We worry about the future. We want our citizens to learn about our history and think about the future and be optimistic about our country and the world. It is a working board. By the way, we have, in our board, we have 12 authors among us and 11 former high-level public servants. And we have numerous philanthropists. And we have many projects, as Lucinda mentioned. I won't go through them all. 
But talk about many projects. The man I'm about to introduce has many, many projects. It was in the fall of 1979, a young congressman named Jim Blanchard was working hard in Congress to enact the Chrysler Loan Guarantee. And in that capacity, I worked directly with the White House on almost a daily basis. And occasionally, the person who would return my calls and talk to me and be helpful was David Rubenstein. I thought at the time, I wonder if he knows anything about business. <laughs> I just wonder, you know? Well, here we are, 42 years and $260 billion later, we know the answer. I know, David doesn't like me to talk about money, I'm sure. But David Rubenstein is not only the co-founder and co-chairman of the successful Carlyle Group with its 29 offices all over the world, but he is the most generous patriotic philanthropist in the entire country. He defines the words patriotic philanthropy. And listen to this list of some of the, the, the organizations uh, and projects that he has supported. He's not only chairman of the board of the Kennedy Center and the Council on Foreign Relations and Economic Club of, of uh, Washington, but here are some of the areas that he's helped. He's made a transformative gifts for the restoration and repair of the Washington Monument, Monticello, Montpelier, Mount Vernon, Arlington House, the Iwo Jima Memorial, the Kennedy Center, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, the Library of Congress, the National Museum of African American History. He has purchased and loaned to our government long-term loans, rare copies of the Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and so much more. And then in his spare time, he has a talk show now that many of you watch on PBS, which is really, really good. I love it. In fact, I record it when I'm not going to be around. I don't do that with much except maybe Michigan State football. So, um, <laughs> and basketball. <laughs> He's now an author, too. He had a little time for that. He has his most recent book is Wisdom from the World's Greatest CEOs. This is a, a person who's done so much for our country, so much for this city, so much for our heritage. <laughs> and as I, as I welcome him to the podium, our dear friend, I want to say we have a lot in common, though. We were both born in August. I give you David Rubenstein. <laughs> Jim, let me thank you for your kind and overly generous words, and thank you for your service to our country as a congressman, governor, and ambassador to Canada. And as chairman of this Archives Foundation. Thank you very much for everything you've done. Um, as I was preparing to uh, come here this evening, I received a letter that uh, was sent to John and was asked that I would read it uh, uh, to him tonight. The letter is from uh, Andrew Jackson. <laughs> Dear John, I write to you as a proud fellow citizen of Tennessee, our nation's greatest state, the state where they are country's most famous and revered homes, the Hermitage and Graceland. <laughs> I'm pleased that you have chosen to continue living there rather than move with the eastern elites to East Hampton or Palm Beach or now the new place that's popular Rehoboth Beach. <laughs> but I'm disappointed a bit that you have been spending recent years promoting Thomas Jefferson and George H.W. Bush and most recently John Lewis, all good men, but you have forgotten your roots and seem to have forgotten your fellow fellow citizen of Tennessee, me. You won your Pulitzer Prize writing about me and not these others, none of whom were really devoted to our home state. None of these others really gave you the inspiration to stay in your home state while writing or talking about politics or public policy. And now I really need your help to focus again on me. There are no more Jefferson Jackson dinners. Fewer people are coming to the Hermitage to pay homage to me just because I was a slave owner and forced the Native Americans to move west. <laughs> Can you help improve my image a bit by writing about some of the good things I did? You had a few of them in your book. 
To be sure, I'm proud of what you've done for America and American history and for the state of Tennessee, but I can assure you there is a special place in heaven reserved for those who remember their old friends and those who helped them become famous. And you deserve to be in that special place. You might get there anyway because of your other good works for America, but I can use my influence to ensure that you get there, and I'm happy to do so. But I need a little help in reminding people of the good things I did for America. Uh, you had them in your book. But for tonight, congratulations on your award, well deserved, and you should know I put in a good word for you to get this award. Not that I'm seeking credit, but just wanted you to know. <laughs> Best regards from your old friend, sincerely, Andrew Jackson. So. Um, I, I, I can't really uh, add to the eloquence of Andrew Jackson, but let me just say a couple of things, if I could, about uh, my friend John Meacham. All of us want to do something in our lives that is meaningful. And for all of us, it's generally difficult to do more than one thing well. And so all of us aspire to be somebody who has done something well, to be an actress like, um, well, the, I, I would say, uh, who was the best actress out there, Kate Catherine Hepburn, someone like that. Everybody wants to be a singer like Frank Sinatra, a dancer like Fred Astaire. Whoever you want to aspire to be, they usually have one skill, one thing they perfected. And that's a good, very good contribution to our society. John is different. John has perfected many skills. And it, just briefly, think about this. He is an incredible writer. He's written best-selling books, books that have influenced the course of way history is actually talked about in our country. And he's also an incredible author of, uh, of books of, that have talked about American history. He's not only a writer that's really good, but he's a writer of history, and he knows history. He, secondly, is a terrific talker. It's one thing to be a good writer. It's another thing to be actually explain things in English that people can understand. So as you've no doubt seen from John's discussions on television uh, and his comment commenting on various things about history, he is the go-to person that so many people want to hear about, hear from when it comes to history or now American politics. He's an expert on American politics as well. And it's very rare to see somebody that's a good writer be a good expert in history, but also an expert in American politics. He's also somebody that actually knows how to give back and give to his, to his own time. He's actually done a lot in the philanthropic area, in the nonprofit area much of which he doesn't talk about, but those of us who know him know that he's always available to help out with a good cause and to help with a very good project. In addition to all this, John is something that is unique with somebody that has all these skills, and there are very few people that can do all these things. He's actually a nice person. Now, very often people that are really talented at doing great things, they're not so nice. Some of you may have met some of these people, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But you know, some of these people that have all these skills, they actually have their ego that they walk around with a lot. And John doesn't do that. He's really modest and I think an incredible person that everybody wants to be a friend, friends with. Um, he's a great eulogist. Um, he gave an incredible uh, eulogy for two friends that we share in common, uh, Barbara Bush and George Herbert Walker Bush. And he was asked by both of them to give their eulogy, which he did wonderfully. And I've often thought that maybe if I'm really lucky I could get John to give my eulogy. So I'm trying to be very nice to John and hope that maybe he'll write one of his great eulogies for me. Final comment I'd make about John is, despite all of the wonderful qualities he has, he hasn't succumbed to something yet that many people that have these qualities succumb to. Uh, very often you're an expert in presidential politics and presidential histories. You meet with presidents. You say, well, that guy's not so great, and if he's president, how come I'm not president? I could be president better than this guy. Many people hang around Washington. Any of you ever met these people who think they should be president of the United States? <laughs> I've met a several thousand of them. Um, <laughs> John hasn't succumbed to that yet, though I would say the country could do a lot worse than John Meacham as president. In fact, I'm not sure we could do a lot better. John is an incredible American. It's my pleasure to call him a friend, and I was just downstairs and I saw an appropriate thing that I wanted to give to John. And it's this hat that only the National Archives would sell. And I'm going to give it to John. It says, National Treasure, John Meacham. Thank you. How do you define the soul of America? In Hebrew and in Greek, 
Soul means breath or life. So I think it's the essence of who we are. I think it's what makes us who we are. And I also see it as not entirely good or entirely bad. I think it's an arena of contention between those worst instincts and our impulses for grace and for love. And the book is called Soul of America. Right. My first question, do we still have one? We do. John Meacham is the leader of a new generation of historians who tells the American experience in writing, in commentating, in teaching. I think he's a very soulful person. He understands the United States of America in a very complex way, but it has at its heart a deeply felt appreciation of who we are. And I think more importantly with the word soulful, what we could become. If I were just meeting John Meacham for the first time, the first word that would come to mind would be his sense of humor. But I've known him for over 20 years, so there's no way in which any first word could describe this great multifaceted character that has now become my friend. He was editing uh, for a major news publication as a very, very young man. He's written now probably a dozen books, and he's on TV commentating, I mean, he's teaching. He's done all that in probably a 20-year period. I mean, this is incredible. Many find history boring, and I think um, historians like John Meacham make history exciting. People can relate to the stories. He humanizes the individuals. They're really an important contribution to our understanding of our history. We are delighted to offer the 2021 Records of Achievement Award to John Meacham. I grew up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, on a Civil War battlefield, and so for me, history was always a real thing. It was a tactile thing. I could still find mine balls uh, from the Battle of Missionary Ridge in our yard. John Meacham, uh, he's a I classic Southern place. writer. Southern writers are tied to the land. They're storytellers. They have a facility with language that other writers don't have. And John Meacham's success for me is his ability to tell stories, to use language in a way that excites and entertains, but also educates. Working at Newsweek was an extraordinary experience for John. Number one, because he learned how to tell stories and to have those stories factually based. But I've always teased him that the greatest experience he had from working in a magazine was learning deadlines, something that I somehow have never learned, which is a good reason why he's able to produce many more books than I can, because he understood at 12 noon this story has to be in. He has the ability to condense large amounts of information in a very, very clear fashion and in a way that makes it accessible to the general public, and that's why he's done very serious history. Members of the founding generation are important to lots of Americans, and they want to know about them. And we went through a period in most of our history in writing about them as if they were carved in marble up on Mount Rushmore. And John takes these people and he gives you an insight into them that makes them human, makes them relatable. What John has been able to do is to not only celebrate the strength of the presidents and the characters that he writes about, but to understand the flaws, the mistakes they made, so that you see them as a whole human being with strengths and weaknesses. And I think that balance that an historian has to somehow figure out, um, he has figured out in spades. John and I have written about subjects who have problematic aspects to their lives. Thomas Jefferson as a slave owner, Andrew Jackson as a slave owner, as the engineer of Indian removal. We have to grapple with those things. The biography of Jefferson, he took very, very seriously. I think it was sort of fitting to have me as an afterward <laughs> to think about Jefferson in relationship to the American experiment with respect to black people, because obviously Jefferson is a figure that we look at because of his attitudes about race, but also because of the Declaration of Independence, words that were used by African Americans and others to make a claim on the American society. John's approach was exactly pitch perfect for putting this out to the public at this very, very interesting time in our history. The most in-depth and complicated biography I've ever attempted is the one on the Roosevelts, all three, Theodore Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. What John did in his seminal work on Churchill in, in FDR is he understood the nuance of a friendship that was at the heart of solving the problem of the greatest cataclysm in human history. There's no other way to say that. And John's book helped make it real for me and then his interview that he gave us gave structure to the end of our fifth and almost the entirety of our sixth episode. 
The National Archives has a huge responsibility in civic education, educating the populace about what their roles and responsibilities are. And for me, the most important book that John has written is The Soul of America, in which he describes the first duties of an American citizen to enter the arena, to get involved, to resist tribalism, understand the opposition, respect facts and deploy reason, find our critical balance, and keep history in mind. All of the projects I've been involved in, and I know all of the projects that John has been involved in, involve the story of us, the story of the United States of America, and the great repository of its doings are in the National Archives. The National Archives has about 15 billion pieces of paper, miles and miles of film and video, 43 million photographs, and about seven billion electronic records. In each one of those, is a piece of a story. And John is a good example of a researcher who knows how to mine those collections to get the details of the story he's trying to tell. There's nothing more treasured, I think, for an historian than to be able to read letters that somebody wrote from the past, to read diaries at night that before they go to bed, they're countering what did they do during that day, to actually hold the papers of some of the people you're writing about. And it's that journey of research that I think underlays the foundation of the books that John writes and makes him such a good historian. He's been a lot of fun to work with. He makes discoveries, he shares discoveries, and he's a good advertisement for the National Archives. Please welcome back to the program, John Meacham, sir. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Let's talk a little Andrew Jackson. We'll get into a couple other things. This guy, was a maniac. He was a maniac. A maniac? Yes. He was the only president who tried to assault his own assassin. <laughs> to me, that's a threshold question for a book. John is a very funny person because he's wry. He also understands that humor is this has this extraordinary continuum in American history. The thing about the American experiment, though, is the Constitution was designed for just this kind of moment. Right. The checks and balances were there, right. the document itself, Hamilton was very good on this when he wasn't rapping. Uh, <laughs> you know. It's refreshing to have witticisms, to have asides, those kinds of things, appropriately in historical writing. I think it puts the reader at ease and it connects you to the reader and this is an important thing. It helps us understand that there is contradiction in everybody. Jackson again, he would always act at two levels. There was the absolute projection of implacability. Meanwhile, he was trying to cut a deal in the back. Some people might call that hypocrisy. I call that statecraft. John has a spectacularly great wink, which is, of course, the beginning or the end of you being had by humor. He has this capacity to mimic some of his characters. So he's not only talking about his people, he's actually talking as if they were talking. And, and then that sly smile comes over his face. Of course it's not them. It's John Meacham being George Bush Sr. or somebody else. Bush 43 asked me what I was working on next, and I said, well, I'm doing this thing with Tim McGraw, and he went, McGraw, I like the wife. <laughs> so, the story of my married life. Right there. I think John Meacham inspires people, and I think he inspires a young generation to want to teach and write and think and talk about the American experience. John clearly enjoys what he's doing. He enjoys the search, he enjoys the research, he enjoys the writing, he enjoys talking about it and it's hard not to come away with some sense of, of joy yourself. One of the things that John and I have always shared is the idea that there's hope in history, that we've been through turbulent times before, and somehow this country came through that. And it allows you to know if those people living at that time who didn't know how the story would end were able to get through their difficult time, it gives us hope for our, our own present and future. If the men and women of the past with all their flaws and limitations and ambitions and appetites, could press on through ignorance and superstition, through racism and sexism, through selfishness and greed, all the panoply of human flaws, to form a more perfect union, then perhaps 
we can too. I'm joined by our Vice Chair, Secretary Rodney Slater. John Meacham, please come up and receive our Records of Achievement Award. We're having a funeral later? <laughs> that was a hell of a eulogy. Governor? It's good when you see you. Yeah, no. I'll be, see, I'll be seeing y'all later because it's all downhill from here. Of our Sorry. board, the archives, all of you, all of our friends, we just present you with this award. Thank all you have to do is smile and let us take a photo, and then we're going to have the program with. with Excellent. Our thank you, Governor. Thank you for thank everything you. you did. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Oh. Can't get ten you can't let Tennesseans out of the state. <laughs> it never works. So welcome to my Episcopalian bar mitzvah. <laughs> All right. And now our board member and friend Sorry. and historian, <laughs> Michael Beschloss. Michael, take it away. Are you over here? Be here. You're, you're Be here. There. All right. Th thanks everyone for coming. Can oh you hear God. me? Oh, can you hear me and John? Okay, yes. we have wonderful technical skills in this building. Oh my. Uh, everyone has been talking about eulogies, and a close friend of John's and mine, who remain nameless, we always say we have to die before John, so he'll be able to do the eulogies at our funerals. So, right, right, right. Uh, we recommend it to anyone. Well, that was incredible. I mean, I, I, I really. My wife is not here. I, I now see why, because uh, she would have had to have a response R time. Rebuttal. Yeah, we don't want that. But but thank you all so much. Uh, hugely hugely grateful. Uh, uh, slightly overwhelmed. Uh, I wasn't expecting that. But Beschloss actually knows everything, uh, and uh, Michael is one of my oldest and dearest friends, and um, it's always uh, always an honor to be with you. And I've been joking with John that at the beginning of this thing tonight, I could say, given how well I know you and all sorts <laughs> of things, what is it worth to you for me not to bring up certain yeah. subjects yeah. in front of us? Yeah, a lot. <laughs> I got some socks and a hat now. That, that's it. We, we never let anyone go away from here empty-handed. And when I was talking to Patrick and Jim and David about doing this, I said, you know, this is not exactly going to be a prosecutorial con conversation <laughs> conducted by me. You know, right. John's youngest daughter, I'm her godfather, uh, and I might no longer be if I give too intrusive true, an true. interview. Yeah. So we have a review then, then I thought maybe we could do this like this is your life, and we could bring <laughs> embarrassing people on the stage from John's past, but didn't think that would, that would be right either. So I think we'll do this biographically and start at the beginning. Sure. Uh, we saw in the film, uh, rumor has it, that you come from Chattanooga. True. Uh, how did you originally get your interest in history? Where, where do you think it comes from? There were two tributaries, uh, one which was in a clip. Uh, I grew up about 700 yards from Braxton Bragg's headquarters on the, for the Battle of Missionary Ridge. Uh, and about three miles the other way was Chief John Ross's house of the Cherokee Nation. So the, these twin tragedies of American history, uh, the slavery and Indian removal. Were, this were this is not your birth. This is, this is the two other. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, that's, the triplet, the that's the triplet, okay. the Rubenstein triplet. Right. Uh, uh, we're right there. And the other thing was my grandfather, who was a judge, uh, and would take me at a very early age, which explains partly why I'm so weird. Uh, there's a lot to blame on any one thing, but uh, down to the courthouse and to this downtown hotel 
where you sat with the mayor and you sat with unindicted. Uh, <laughs> I, I should say unconvicted. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're trying to keep this truthful. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, and so to me, history, biography was always ambient. It was always human. Because uh, you'd see the mayor on TV or something, but you actually sort of knew what he was like. And so I think it was those two things. And I just loved to read um, and read the Churchill War memoirs very early. Uh, uh, there was this young guy, y'all may have heard of him. Uh, he wrote a book about Kennedy and Roosevelt, a young Beschloss. Uh, if you haven't seen the jacket photo, it's actually not possible they're the same person. Uh, I, I look exactly the same at the age of 24. <laughs> it's as if Holden Caulfield had written that book. Uh, it's this great image. Um, so it was these three things. And then I went to, uh, I went to Suwannee, uh, the University of the South, um, which is best understood as a combination of Downton Abbey and Deliverance. Um, <laughs> So, Care to tell us in what respect? So. No, I don't. I don't. I don't. But I, I appreciate your follow-up, though. Uh, and uh, so that was a big literary place. I majored mostly in Jack Daniels, but, uh, but had a great roommate from Lynchburg named Jack Daniels. Uh, but I went to work in the local newspaper, uh, the Chattanooga Times, after my first year in college, uh, just for the summer. And it was a great, it was the Chattanooga Times, which was Adolf Ox's first newspaper. Uh, it was the one he bought before he but that slightly more successful second investment of the New York Times. Uh, and so, and that was it. It just sort of, that you could write, be around important things. It was just great fun. And I, I think from our talks over the years, I would not underestimate the importance of your grandfather. Absolutely. You know, tell a little bit more about him. Oh, that's a, that's a sweet story. Uh, He's a Vanderbilt alumnus, uh, was the founder's medal. Be best thing that ever happened to him, he said, except marrying your grandmother, of course, he would add when she was there, <laughs> uh, was, uh, he was he was the founder's medalist at Vanderbilt Law School, and uh, which was the number one. He was a classmate of uh, Pauline Gores, uh, who was the, only the second woman to go to Vanderbilt Law School, I think. And uh, so he, pra he, went, he, he joined the Navy he was born in 1913. And his name? Ellis Meacham, mm -hmm. Ellis Meacham. And he, one of the sweeter things about, about his story, I think, is he was married. Uh, my, his first child was on the way. But then Hitler invades the Soviet Union. And he realized in June of 41 that this was inevitably coming. And so he wanted to be at the front of the line. And he joined the Naval Reserve and was actually in New Orleans when Pearl Harbor happened and then spent four years in the Pacific. Um, he was, we all, all of us who have uh, naval grandfathers and fathers, everybody thinks their figure is Pug Henry. This guy was pretty much Pug Henry uh, from, from, from the winds of war. But he was a frustrated, he, he, he didn't particularly like practicing law. As I don't actually know anyone who does. Uh, so, <laughs> you got to keep it together. If, if there's anyone who does, they're in this room. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, so he was, so C.S. Forster, right? Horatio Hornblower, um, those novels, sort of the early Patrick O'Brien, I guess, is when I think about it. Uh, he loved those books. And C.S. Forster died leaving an unfinished novel. And I think it was the Saturday Evening Post, wasn't it, that used to uh, serialize Hornblower. And so they serialized the unfinished novel of C.S. Forster. And my grandfather's 53, 54 years old, and reads it, decides how he thinks Forster would have finished the story, sits down at the dining room table, types out, writes, writes I guess it was about 30,000 words, types it up and sends it. No one's asked him to do this. <laughs> you know. It was not, yeah. Sends it to Little Brown, says, by the way, I think this is how it would finish if you'd like to have this. And in a the kind of letter, the kind of, uh, in those days, emails that we send all the time, so they wrote back saying, no, Mrs. Forrester doesn't want to finish, doesn't want to do this, but if you ever have a story of your own, we'd be happy to look at it. The 
you know, that's the wasp brush off, right? I mean, that, 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 that's, what, that's what we do. And, um, but he took it seriously. And he said, I always thought I had a sort of an invitation. And so he sits down and wrote the first of three novels uh, based on the East India Company, uh, the Bombay Marine, and loved it, loved that far more. He also wrote an unfinished uh, or unpublished novel about a terrible lynching in Chattanooga that we just, um, uh, the city just commemorated in 1906. Uh, it was the only direct criminal trial the Supreme Court ever held, uh, was the murder of a innocent uh, black man in, in Chattanooga uh, who was shot 52 times uh, on a bridge that's now named for him. Um, and he had, the sheriff had been the bad guy in this, and so he wrote this, he wrote about that. So it, it was a, this was all in the atmosphere, right? This was the, this was the wallpaper. Sure. Uh, jumping around a little bit, as you may have heard here in the archives, we do primary sources, among other things. What's the most interesting primary source or collection that you've ever looked at? That when you encountered it, yeah. you were just excited and you were learning all sorts of stuff that had not been known? The first one was, and I'm, it was at the FDR library, um, was a letter that Lucy Mercer Rutherford had written Franklin Roosevelt in 19, I think it was 1941, when we were trying to carbon date it mm -hmm. um, uh, with various clues. And there was a physical thrill because here was the voice of this woman who was part of, this, part of the tableau but not, but had been pretty much frozen right. uh, all the way through. And, um, oh, this is a good story. Um, listen up. Uh, <laughs> so, and Michael lived, lived, lived this with me, but remember. At the copy, as you all know, this is the only room in America where I don't have to explain copyright law. Uh, <laughs> but, just for a second, um, the Rutherfords owned this letter, right? So even though FDR received it, I couldn't quote more than 25 words, right, without permission. And you all remember, this is, the woman who was a long time, uh, what's the appropriate term now? Paramour. Paramour. Uh, uh, this is, and when you're asking Beschloss <laughs> what the appropriate term is, we're in trouble. Uh, <laughs> people have come to us sometimes and want us to be like the two guys in the Muppet balcony. <laughs> uh, just doing show. That reminds me of John Tyler. Right. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to get... Uh, and, yes, and only you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, so, but it was really amazing, and it was so... Uh, she had been Eleanor Roosevelt's social secretary. She was a Catholic girl from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, 1918, FDR has double pneumonia. He comes back from uh, the visiting the front. Uh, the love letters from Lucy, Ruth, Lucy Mercer, as she was then, to FDR... Mrs. Roosevelt finds them in the, like, finding texts. So this has been going on a long time. Uh, uh, finds them in the trunk. Great crisis in the marriage. Uh, and then, allegedly, the way the story is usually told is uh, the price of Eleanor staying and thereby saving his political career was that he would never see her again. But, of course, as you all know, in April, there were some occasions during the war, and then on April 12, 1945, Lucy Mercer Rutherford, as she was then, uh, was very much uh, at Warm Springs when FDR dies. Uh, but that's kind of what, and there were some reports of some daily, some day trips and things here, but it was pretty quiet. Uh, this was the first time, and this was 2002, the first letter that, that I knew of uh, that was actually Lucy talking, Mrs. Rutherford talking. And it was this incredibly eloquent, very reassuring. Uh, one of the great lines was, this is before we were fully in the war, so it's early 41. Everything that is dear to us is now in your cherished and capable hands. If you're Franklin Roosevelt and you're in a wheelchair and you have to deal with Congress, and you have to deal with the isolationists, and you're dealing with Charles Lindbergh, and you're preparing for a global struggle, you've been trying to rescue democracy for eight years, that's what you wanna hear. Mm -hmm. 
right? And so it was just, but it, it went on, like a great boarding school handwriting. So, but because of the copyright law, right, I couldn't, I, I could only do that. So I find uh, the daughter, the last daughter, um, Barbara was her name, I think, Barbara Rutherford, living in Aiken, South Carolina. And I called her up and I said, I have found a letter of your mother's. And in a voice that would chill anyone, <laughs> she says, where? <laughs> I said, this is not going to go hugely well. <laughs> uh, but I said, well, in the FDR library, ma'am, by the ma'am, and because she's in South Carolina, I'm dropping every G. I'm, you know, <laughs> you know I got to get my grits, and then I can read you the letter. You know, I was doing everything I could. Everything. You know, uh, so finally I realized, and this is, this is where sort of being in journalism and doing this have fed each other. Mm -hmm. I just said, may I come see you, ma'am? Because I wanted to see her, first of all. And I just said, I'd like to come and show you this and explain it. And she said yes. And so I remember being in Tennessee and then driving to Aiken. And um, in this house that was a little like arsenic and old lace meets horse country, right? <laughs> so big house. And I start to read it. I said, let me just read this to you, ma'am. And I'm reading it. And I hear her crying. Hmm. And she said, of course you can use that letter. I have just heard my mother's voice again. Oh, that's, that's, that's why you all, your support for this is so important, because it makes th things like that possible. It shed light on the human dimension of the most important war president, uh, as Ken was saying, the greatest cataclysm. World War I, with the possible exception of the passion and crucifixion of Jesus is the largest event in human history. A war that starts with a, what we were 14th in the world, and it ends when we get the capacity to end all human life. Mm -hmm. Pretty big, mm -hmm. right? And so th that was a document in the system that shed genuine light. That's one, the other is uh, just having the audio diary of George H.W. Bush. Uh, he didn't write a diary, he talked. And it's like, as Dana Carvey said, it's like Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. <laughs> you know. <laughs> George Mitchell's pissing me off. Uh, you know. Um, I told Barr not to say, anyway. Uh, so, and being able, he often um, would, as you know, he would record early in the morning or late at night. Sometimes on Marine One, sometimes on Air Force One. So there, sometimes there are engines going. You could often hear a little clink of ice. I'm sure it was Dr. Pepper <laughs> uh, at night. Um, but what, was, what is so fascinating is, is as close, to go to David's point, blessedly for America, is as close as I'll ever get to being President of the United States, is listening to someone talk on a daily basis about what it's like. And I worried, uh, Michael, Michael was the godfather of many things, including this project. Uh, Michael was the person who introduced me to George Bush, um, which is like introducing, you know, who introduced you to your second wife? You know, it's that kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's that kind of. Only if it goes well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, but I worried as I was going through it that he was overly obsessed with the press. And I was thinking, how is he watching so much news? Because he knows what Leslie Stahl said. He knows what Britt Hume says. And he's like, I don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, and so he was just, and I was like, my God, you know, it's amazing the Berlin Wall came down. He's so busy watching. <laughs> this, this is a great archival kind of story. So, but I thought it was so disproportionate. And I went to Tim McBride, you know, Tim, uh, former body man uh, for uh, George H.W. Bush. I said, walk me through the morning. And Tim said, uh, Tim's greatest memory was, you know, I grew up in Detroit, and we didn't call them shirtings in Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, President Bush would say, you know, the son of Greenwich, where's my shirting? Yeah, I was like, we didn't call it that. Uh, but he said, so what the president would do would be to take the briefcase, and he'd pick up 
the tape recorder for the diary. He'd have the daily schedule. And he'd pick up the White House news summary, which was an invention of Pat Buchanan. Yes. Because Pat Buchanan thought Nixon was too even keeled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anybody want to walk me through that one? Buchanan, when he was communications director, started putting together a compilation of what all the folks were saying on television to get Nixon mad. Mm -hmm. Really worked out well. Uh, and, so, and the great thing is Nixon's comments, you know, he'll read something that makes him angry and Nixon will write in the margin, go kill him. <laughs> right. Firebomb and house. Gordon, Gordon Liddy took that seriously. Yeah, no. <laughs> but it, it is one of these things that has kept going. And so what he was doing was he would have the briefcase and he'd be going to Camp David or he'd go down to the study. And so as he was dictating, he would be reading the news summary. And so he would just be musing about it. Was, he wasn't watching TV, thank God. But it took me about two years to figure mm -hmm. out, to figure that out. But that too is one of the great. And that was an unusual, because you've done both as, as well. It's interesting writing about someone who you could talk to people who knew them as opposed to the, the, the truly dead. Sure. Uh, and, That's and, a category. And, and, and <laughs> speaking about the truly dead, a Andrew Jackson. Uh, Great letter, by the way. Thank you, David. Yes. Uh, talking about people who have original primary sources, David, a letter from Andrew Jackson that we hadn't seen before. Uh, how, how should we look at Jackson differently in 2021 yeah. from the way he was looked at for most of American history? Yeah. That's a very important, serious question. I'll get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I have to very quickly tell you my favorite, so it's about three of my favorite topics, and it's a true story. It's George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, Andrew Jackson, and Donald Trump, okay? I know it sounds like a joke and there's one parachute, but <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story. So in March of 2017, uh, it's announced that President Trump is coming down to the Hermitage in Nashville to... This, this one actually has the added advantage of being true. It's true, it's true. So he's coming down and he's gonna embrace Jackson. And so I'm sitting at home, and I think I should do something about this. So I write an open letter to the president saying, Dear Mr. President, delighted you're embracing history, but if you're going to do it, if you're going to embrace Jackson, don't just embrace the crazy parts, right? And there are plenty of crazy parts, right? He, he, he says it's only two regrets with he had not hung Henry Clay and shot his own vice president, John C. Calhoun. Nobody felt that way about their vice president until... <laughs> Jan <know>. January. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, and that's, you know, Jackson was a unionist. Uh, he kept us together, gave us an additional 30 years to have what Lincoln would call the mystic chords of memory. Wrote this piece, sent it to the local newspaper, the Tennessean in Nashville, John C. Gonzalez old paper. And they, in a very brave editorial decision, they ran it entire, the whole front page that day was this open letter from me to Donald Trump. It had no effect, whatever, of course. <laughs> but the next day I was walking into lunch and my phone rang, and it was President Bush, senior. And he'd spent a lot of that winter down at Methodist at Houston in the hospital. And so his staff was giving him stuff to read, and they'd given him this thing. So he called up, he said, how you doing? I said, I'm fine, Mr. President. He said, I'm fine. He said, I read your letter to Jackson. I thought, oh, shit, the old boy's lost it, right? He thinks I'm writing letters to dead people. It's a true story. I said, Mr. President, thank you. I'm glad you're doing better. You know, actually, sir, that was a letter to, to Trump about Jackson. And without missing a beat, the old man said, yeah, but Jackson will pay more attention. <laughs> <laughs> Honest to God. And then he hung up. He had thought of the joke. He was 93 years old. He said, see ya, boom, that was it. Um, so the important question you asked, Michael. Um, so look, my view of Jackson, uh, which is a little bit different than Jefferson, uh, but let's since David exhumed him, um, Jackson represents the best of us and the worst of us. And I mean us. Uh, I, I declined to be lectured um, about the uh, moral failings of an American president for people who live on land that is, was appropriated from people. Right. Um, 
this country is complicit as a nation uh, in these twin tragedies. Uh, and the story of the country has to be redeeming ourselves from those things. And I mean that in terms of we were founded on an idea, what David likes to say, one of the most important sentences ever originally rendered in English, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator, and that we operate on that principle in order to try to find a more perfect union. And why wouldn't it be imperfect and sinful and fallen and frail and horrible sometimes? Because guess what? Unless you're a lot different than me, you're sinful and fallen and frail and fallible and terrible sometimes. And sometimes you're great and good. And sometimes we have hours of grace and kindness. And sometimes we have hours of cruelty and coldness. That's what we are. And a democracy is the sum of its parts. So why would the country be any different than us? The whole struggle is to get it right just over half the time. I mean, aim for 100. God bless you. You know, bless your heart, as we say in the South. <laughs> You're not going to get there. Nobody has since the first chapter of Genesis. I mean, maybe you will. This is what John Lewis and I disagreed about this. He's John Lewis, believe him. Mm -hmm. But Congressman Lewis really believed that the beloved community could come, up, could come into being. That, in fact, if we all did the right thing, we could produce perfection on Earth. I don't think that's possible. But he was willing to die for his version. And I just pop off about mine. So <laughs> he's, he's the one to listen to there. Um, so I, you know, I don't get excited about the $20 bill and, and all that. I think that, I think if anything, our currency should have more people on it anyway. You know, like the British do that. You know, there are lots of Americans to commemorate. Um, I just, and I'm not defending him, I'm not Andrew Jackson's defense lawyer, but I am someone, I think, who sees him and that era whole, and as our friend, late friend Arthur Slazinger used to say, self-righteousness in retrospect is easy, also cheap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Uh, John Lewis, what was the experience John spent hour after hour talking to him no. literally on his deathbed. Yeah. Uh, what, what was that like just as a human experience? It was, it, was, it was terrible and sweet and humbling. Um, he, I believe he was a saint. Uh, I believe he'll be ultimately canonized by various Protestant denominations. Uh, I really do. A saint is, so saint, sainthood means to set apart or make holy. And the definition is, are you willing to suffer and to die for the ideal of the gospel? And he was. Again and again and again. Arrested 45 times. Uh, think about it. He was in far more danger when we couldn't see him than when we could. He spent 40 days in Parchman Prison in the Mississippi Delta. Faulkner called Parchman destination doom. Uh, and that saintliness was he never raised a fist back. What he learned in Nashville, uh, he comes in, John's life was very biblical. His name wasn't John Lewis at first. So like Abraham, who was Abram, and Elijah, and Peter, and Mary of Mary, uh, his name was changed when he received a different kind of work. And he grew up in Troy, Alabama, Carter's Quarters. His great-grandfather was born into enslavement. Um, he comes to Nashville to American Baptist Theological Seminary. This burst of creativity there, James Bevel, Bernard Lafayette, uh, C.T. Vivian, and John Lewis, were in a school where there were 100 students. So, Three of those people have won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. That's a pretty good alumni letter for somebody, <laughs> right? Uh, but he was taught by Jim Lawson, who was at Vanderbilt Divinity School and had been a conscientious objector. I think Lawson is probably the most important American that not enough people know about. Uh, he really was the teacher of the young people who then went to downtown Nashville and went on the Freedom Rides and did everything. 
all without raising a, um, a fist. Here's one thing about the brevity and the fascinating work that you all do. So we were here, what, two weeks ago at, we were at a service at the National Cathedral. And I'm standing there with my family toward the end of it. And an older woman walks up and starts to talk to me. And she said, I've wanted to meet you. I said, well, you're the only one. You know. <laughs> uh, she said, because I was in Nashville. I was at Fisk in 1961. Mm -hmm. And she said, and they set my hair on fire. Mm -hmm. And I said, ma'am? And she said, Mr. Lawson told us not to fight back. And they took cigarettes and caught my hair on fire. And there's this, she's just tiny. But here we are, five minutes away from that. So why would we think we couldn't, it can't happen again? This was the day before yesterday. Uh, speaking of which, uh Soul of America, and I, I think I would have said this even if I did not know you, but I think that's a very emotional book. I think it connects to you in a more primal way than maybe anything else you've ever written. Uh, if I'm right, right, talk about that a little bit. Well, those of, I suspect this is shared by some of, some of you all, and I know Michael does to some extent too. We've given a big chunk of our lives to studying, sometimes celebrating, sometimes criticizing the story of a country that is facing a profound crisis of principle. And I, even two or three years ago, I, was, I, I wasn't as concerned as Michael was. Michael was ahead of me on this, as on so much else. But after January 6th, it seems to me, okay, this is in fact democracy's hour of maximum danger. Right? The woman who was here earlier tonight very well could have been assassinated on January 6th. I know the man who is now a felon who was driving here with a van of guns and ammunition threatening to kill the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. So, Again, this, this isn't notional. This isn't uh, a bunch of whiny liberals on cable. This happened, and it continues to unfold, and this is not a partisan point. It's really not, and the fact that it sounds partisan shines a light on what we have to do, which I think is this. As long as you're a constitutional adherent as long as you believe that the Declaration of Independence was our mission statement, the Constitution is our user's guide, every generation that has been commemorated in a positive way has been one in which the definition and understanding of the mainstream has been widened, not constricted, where there's been possibility, not a loss of opportunity, every generation. That's what you want to do. We know what to do. It's very hard, right? But the framers understood this. And it, it's not popular to say anything nice about the framers. But they got sin right. They understood depravity. They understood their own appetites and ambition. And so they set up the system to check it. And when we go beyond that, when we stretch it out and possibly smash it, we do so at our peril. Because what's going to replace it? And so I think the, the emotion, to, the, the emotion it is emotional because we've given our lives to this story. And it's a time of fundamental critique of the principles of that story. And it's a time of enormous pressure because what if I'm wrong? What if our better angels don't tend to prevail? What if they don't scramble the angelic jets this time? All right, well, let me ask you the question. Uh, as you know, I've got two sons. You've got a son and two daughters, including my beloved goddaughter, Maggie, the best of the three, of course. <laughs> uh, 
She won the Model UN representing Madagascar today. Perfect. I said, what was the issue? She said, I don't really know. I said, <laughs> I said you'll be a great diplomat. <laughs> I think she had read you on George H.W. Yeah, Bush. Yeah, yeah, uh, not going to uh, do it. But here's the question. Uh, are my kids and your kids, are they going to live their lives in a democracy? I believe so. But I have more doubt today than I did 11 months ago. Absolutely. And, and, Be because? Because a, a, a party that I believe, the party of Eisenhower, Nixon, Reagan, Ford, the Bushes, Romney, McCain, you can disagree. And, and with by them. the way, when when I hear uh, John derided in certain certain oh. uh, ideological media as a left wing historian, oh my god! I just remember when I first met him, and he had this big bust of Ronald Reagan yeah. on his shelf. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. No, it's 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 great actually, uh, because but, I mean it's bad. Democracy dying is bad, but but the the. the <laughs> You, you the, see that when you write about a president, you talk like him. How many years were you writing about George H.W. <laughs> <laughs> bad, 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 bad. bad. Um, so I think if you, that party has taken flight from reason. It's not partisan. I'm sure there are Republicans here. But let's be honest, if you are a Republican, you were not in the fall of 2015 thinking, hey, I know what we're going to do. We're going to elect this guy. And then we're going to fall into a cult of personality so we can get the right tax rates and judges. And, you and, and get really violent. Yeah, you weren't thinking that. And I know the folks in Nashville weren't because I used to see them as they went off to their bundle events for Jeb. And then six months later, they were all for Trump. Well, what happened? Trump won. That's the only thing that changed. So, uh, but again, I'm not, I, I have a very basic standard here. Um, I have a theory that, uh, for what it's worth, that one of the reasons we're where we are, there's a conventional line of thinking that Michael's very familiar with, that somehow or another the Trumpification of the Republican Party is this fruit of the poison tree, right? That Nixon and Reagan and uh, Bush, the Bushes, they all catered to these people, and then the, the patients took over, right? You, you know this argument. I disagree. I actually think the opposite, which is that starting with Eisenhower, each Republican president until 2017 tended to run to the right and govern from the center. Mm -hmm. Who appointed Earl Warren? Who appointed William Brennan? Who appointed Harry Blackman, who wrote the Roe decision? Uh, we, can, we could run through this for, forever. Uh, and W would tell you that there's a direct line between TARP and Trump. So this, I think what happened is, the, is that it, instead of the Republican Party somehow being this cor an unfolding corrupt enterprise, that in fact, it was a human reaction to by a base of folks. And then, to go back to the wisdom of the founders, there's this, the allure of power. And um, so I, I, what I think we do, I think we do what you all do, I think you do what the archives does, I think you talk about the past, you study moments that were difficult and contingent and conditional and you realize that we got through them, not, not only because of leadership, but because enough of us saw each other as neighbors and not as adversaries. Mm -hmm. uh, one final question, I think probably everyone wants to eat. And yes. we've, we've agreed to keep this to a certain amount of time. Uh, Can we show the movie again, though? <laughs> <laughs> He wants to make sure that his wife Keith sees it because she won't believe it. Right? I just want so, this. This is going to be. A, I'm going to have a video Christmas card with the link. <laughs> so if you all get it, just click. Right. Truer words never spoken. Uh, as you know, the archives and our foundation does a lot with civics education and education about democracy. 
Do you think that one reason why a lot of people in this country seem not to be very eager to defend democracy is that the education has not been good enough and they don't know what it is and they're indifferent to it? I, I do, and I, I think, and the great news is, this is about storytelling. Robert Penn Warren has that great poem, you know, in the century and moment of madness, tell me a story, tell me a story, make it a story of great distances and starlight, make it a story of deep delight. That's what history should be. And I think people don't know what we've overcome to achieve what we have. So I know uh, I would say this anyway. I have what I call the Lyndon Johnson test, which is in the incredibly important eight days between Bloody Sunday and President John, we just saw the speech downstairs, and the, the great speech of March 15th, 1965, President Johnson summons George Wallace to Alabama, I mean to Washington from Alabama. And he sits him on the couch, and Wallace was a little guy, and President Johnson was the opposite. Uh, and Wallace sort of sinks down in the couch, and President Johnson looms over him and says with some colorful terms, uh, my favorite being when uh, George, he's, President Johnson says, George, why can't you get these school boards to do? And he says, well, I can't control school boards. To which the president and I says, don't shit don't me, shit George, George Wallace. Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> and and then, I wish, I've always wished that one was on tape, which oh it was Oh my not. God. It's, it's, it's one of the great scenes. Because here, and I do believe that this is, a, this is part of what will happen if we, if we come through this. Then he says, what do you want your tombstone to say? Do you want a scrawny little pine tombstone that says, George Wallace, he hated? Or do you want a noble stone tombstone that says, George Wallace, he built? Lyndon Johnson, in that moment, boils down to its essence a practical vision of how do we incentivize the continuation of this counterintuitive experiment in democracy. We can't just say it's the right thing to do and be on TV like we are and say, oh, if only they would do X or Y. That's not the way the world works. It'd be great if it did, but it doesn't. You have to appeal to people's incentives. Speaker Pelosi has a great line. She talks about people's equities. What are their equities? And then you tell me what their equities are and I can, I can do this. So what, what I think is we have to ask people, how do you want to be remembered? It's the portrait test. And the great thing is, when you talk to politicians about the portrait test, they can't imagine a world where they're not looking at their portrait. Uh, so that, I'm, I'm sure, Governor, that's different for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. I know, I know. Blanchard has little mask cards of his. Uh, but, um, so I think, I think that's the key, is that you tell a story. Do you want to be John Lewis, or do you want to be Bull Connor? Do you want to be Lyndon Johnson, or do you want to be Andrew Johnson? Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. I know who I want to be, but we have to edu what the work we have to do is we have to create an infrastructure where that question makes sense, and then people can answer it. Right now, it's, it's pitched too high, I admit that. But that's why we should do, we have to do this. And you can do it without indoctrinating and all that. I mean, the, don't, don't, th these battles are important, I know, but we can get overly distracted by, I call it the tyranny of the Chiron. You know, the Chiron is the caption across a cable TV screen. And, the Constitution's more important than that. Well, before we go in and eat, all I would say is you can see why we are giving John the Records of Achievement Award. Oh, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Nice work. Thank you. Perfect. Moving. We're watching the movie. Go watch the movie again. <laughs> Just dismissed.
Well, we are um, about to uh, eat, but uh, I think it important to acknowledge that um, we have already been fed, uh, not uh, sustenance of the stomach necessarily, but clearly sustenance of the soul. Um, democracies, our maximum danger. You can't say it uh, any clearer than that. And the response actually may be etched on the walls of this great building, on the Constitution side in particular. Eternal vigilance, the cost, the price of liberty. The answer to the challenge is here, with the records of our history, the stories of those who responded bravely, those who were guided by the better angels of our nature. Uh, this has been a wonderful opportunity to get out and about, to come back together. And we want to thank um, Michael Beschloff and uh, John Meacham for that most insightful and inspiring uh, conversation. Again, something that fed our soul. I hope that, uh, as with the case uh, with all of you and with me, that uh, you have um, experienced uh, a deep appreciation and understanding for the work of uh, historians uh, to not only tell us about our past, but to give us um, um, steel and spine in our present and to give us hope for the future. Uh, this includes our, the, concludes our theater program. We'd like to thank everyone who was a part of making tonight possible. And we'd like uh, uh, to, our, to our archivists Say thank you for your wonderful leadership, Mr. Chairman and the board, all of the members of the staff, a great evening. Now we invite all of you to join us in the Rotunda Gallery for the remainder of uh, the feeding of the evening. Thank you for being here.